Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Bartholomew Bland, Executive Director of the Lehman College Art Gallery, which is co-organized or co-organizer with the Coral Gables Museum of Alienations 2020, uh, an exhibition of 24 artists who are exploring different means and modes of alienation from society. Uh, and we, I am lucky enough to be joined today by Patrick Jacobs. Um, a very well-known artist uh, who I have worked with in the past on, uh, I think, two occasions, uh, and uh, we're very, we're very pleased to be uh, to be joined with them. Hello, Patrick. Hi, Bart. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And I see you've got a very interesting background. Where are you uh, coming to us from today? Uh, this is the. I'm, so I'm talking to you from my studio. In the background is uh, some printmaking uh, materials. Looks like there's a there's a an etching press, Charles Brown etching press. And yeah. you can see the inks and stuff. And this is a, a table with supplies and things and um Chris at work at their um uh, in their studio. So thank you for joining us today. Uh and um I was wondering if you could we could start by just talking about a little bit about your art in general. Yeah. I know that you've been moving into a lot of uh you you've I, I went to your most recent uh, show, which I guess was on um, this past fall, um, which I actually uh, worked on an essay for. And I, I was very struck by the sort of shifting um, quality of some of your work. And so uh, the pandemic may have shifted your work um, in the past 10 months. Yeah, that's right. So my work generally has to do with issues surrounding landscape for the most part. Traditionally, uh, I've been, been doing for about 20 years now. So actually since I, I graduated uh, from grad school uh, and I started working on dioramas, sort of miniature landscapes that are sort of viewed through uh, uh, sort of a, a window of glass lenses. Um, that's something I've been working on and developing and that's evolved over time. They used to be very specific and then became more imaginative. And those pieces gave way to larger installations, uh, which were are, which are more immersive, but in a very different sort of way. Uh, so there's shifts in scale, dioramas being a um, very uh, typical, uh, being a mainstay of, of my work, I'd, I'd say. But, you know, the work uh, that I've been doing I'd say for the last 10 years has moved also into printmaking and other kinds of sculpture. Uh, materials uh, range from uh, found uh, objects, mud and sticks, things from the landscape itself or uh, you know, carefully constructed uh, miniature uh, dioramas. Uh, so uh, there's a wide range of possibilities, but they, you know they, everything kind of comes down to landscape and art. And, and what, what was that initial attraction? I mean, uh, we were talking about I've I've done a lot of work with the Hudson River School, but but what? Uh, so of course I tend to see your work perhaps through that lens a little bit. But what was your initial attraction to landscape? Well, that's a good question. I guess when I was in school. I think it was a very basic idea of uh, our perception of, of nature, the ideal landscape uh, uh, as a sort of a cultural con uh, construct. So, um, and then I was more interested in um, the things- that were you, like were you, are, you are you thinking about like the sort of nationalism of landscape or the political uh, contesting for resources? Were those the sorts of things that were drawing you to it? No, I think environmental concerns and in politi politics has been become much more important for me over time. But initially, it was really more about, um, in, a, in a loose sort of sense, identity and sense of, um, you know, what in a landscape belongs. What's natural? What what is nature? What is natural? What is what do we? What are our concepts of what is right? What is beautiful? What what fits into um, the paradigm of what of of nature in uh, uh, for us is that sort of thinking about like what is sympathetic on the landscape in a in a kind of design sort of way the way you would sort of think about an 18th century garden or is it more about um, what's jarring on the landscape 
All right. So what, what I was initially drawn to, and this is going to sound a little odd, but I think it's gets right to what you're talking about, and that it was uh, pest control, essentially. So in a, in a garden or in the home, uh, these, are cons these are settings you know, that are controlled. Uh, they have a, uh, uh, they, they should conform to our idea of what is, is normal, right? So uh, you can't have insects or weeds, uh, uh, pests uh, sort of invading those, uh, those uh, worlds or spaces. And, and so uh, initially I was just looking at pest control manuals for the most part is where do you apply pest, pesticides and chemicals to eradicate uh, pests so you can maintain a beautiful and perfect uh, garden or a, a beautiful, safe and ideal home. Uh, and those spaces, those images in these manuals became sort of uh, the thing that I wanted to recreate. So they were very banal, very uh, uninteresting in a sense, was sort of, here's a garden, and this is how you apply a pesticide in this particular corner of the garden. And so that became a setting, a setting for a diorama, a sort of a scene that was meticulously constructed uh, to look exactly like that, but in miniature. But do you think, I mean, and when you're talking about the pesticides and creating the perfect garden, I mean, is this the idea that there's a kind of ruthlessness or poisoned quality to any kind of perfection that there's, uh, I mean, to me, that's always sort of when you think about perfection is it demands either a kind of refusal or negation of something to sort of clarify and purify the idea, the artwork, the thought down to something. And there's, to me, always it strikes me a bit of ruthlessness about that. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, I, to me, I was, I was interested in even the idea of more, what, what is, um, yeah, there is a ruthlessness to it and, and um, an insidious sort of quality to it. But you know, where is it coming from? Is it coming from the insects that are burrowing into the garden or is it, is it our own? Is it our own sort of um, uh, attempt to master and, uh, the environment and, and poison it to the point that it becomes acceptable? But then we're sort of destroying it in the same way. So um, it gets back a little bit to that notion of what's a weed, which is, I guess, anything exactly. that does a cool. belong there, right? That's and the, so, uh, so many of those early dioramas I was constructed, the, the, uh, I was constructing the, the uh, subject matter, front and center is usually, well, many times a weed, a dandelion, set within a beautiful uh, idealized landscape. A kind of a beautiful frame, as it were, for the uh, yeah, with winding rivers and beautiful mountains and uh, copses of trees and things in the background. Well, I thought it was very interesting. You mentioned that this early on when you were doing this work, you were interested in the idea of pests and pesticide, and that kind of leads very naturally to the work that you have in Alienations 2020, which is very much in. Um, the mode that you're best known for, in i.e. one of these keyhole uh, pieces, uh, but the piece which is called Raked Leaves Apparition, um, uh, it very much perhaps could use some pesticide, <laughs> pesticide <laughs> because in the figure, uh, the image, um, there is a, a, a almost sort of monstrous or perhaps friendly creature that's emerging um, uh, out of the uh, forest floor, uh, that is. I, I, I almost, I almost wonder if maybe there's so many pesticides that it, you know the things are just on on steroids. They're sort of gone. They've gone crazy. I don't. I don't they, know. That's an interesting idea that they ask yes, that the uh, weeds are going to fight back in some sort of uh, dangerous. Uh, yeah, dangerous. some genetic code was disturbed, and they just went crazy. I, I don't. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you think this? Do you think that this sort of relates to the idea of being alienated? Were you? Uh, is there a, a sense of alienation in some of your works? Because when you know, I will be very frank. The first I can remember the first time I saw one of your keyhole pieces, um, at, which is going back a number of years ago uh, in a gallery and being utterly delighted by it and not really seeing that darker undertone that you described a little bit to us here. And I know has become perhaps more overt um, in uh, some of your later work as it's, uh, as it's moved along um, with, I, I, do you think that's a valid thought or yeah. do you think you're more willing to? Well, I think that's, I think that's right. I think initially the, the uh, the concern of mine was to draw you in and, and to say, uh, to lure you in and uh, with something attractive. 
and then in some way sort of you're trapped, you know, and then pull the rug out from under you in a way. But it's very subtle. Yeah, the artist is Venus flytrap. Is that what you're? Uh... <laughs> That's right. It's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, Venus flytrap, I guess. Now, have you ever had one of those sort of uh, uh, cannibalistic plants in one of your? Uh, yes. Oh, you, in one of the pieces. Yeah. Uh, literally or. Um, Recreated. Recreated. Uh, I mean, have you? Uh, I mean, have you? I, 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 that hasn't been one of the flowers that you've done, or one of we, the plants. That maybe that's an idea for a new piece. I mean, initially, I think the the the, the flora were more mundane and more everyday, uh, yeah. less exotic and more typical. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the contrast with the the land, you know, the surrounding fr framing sort of landscape, which was more. Uh, what would be interesting to me when we're talking about the Venus flytrap, and of course, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking about a whole monologue that's in one of Tennessee Williams' plays, uh, Suddenly Last Summer, in which the character is talking about this very ominous, uh, you know, kind of sexuality and ominous sort of um, relationship her son had. Um, and uses the Venus flytrap, uh, which she's obviously feeding these flies to throughout the monologue. But it, it, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking that I know that you um, spent part of your growing up in Florida, uh, up in North Florida, I believe, since we're doing this for our, our Miami-centric uh, Coral Gables audience. Um, but no. but what I notice is that I don't think of, when I think of your work, I've seen swamps, I've seen things that are very much of a, Hudson River School, more temperate climate. I don't recall seeing sort of jungle foliage or that kind of fetid, uh, tropical, uh, overtly tropical scene. Is that true? Or I think that's I think that's right. I uh, I've I've created a lot of different kinds of landscapes, and, I, and there's not that there's any reason not for doing that. It's just uh, um, I think the landscapes earlier on were defined. I think more by art history than anything. And that, that what I mean to say is uh, Northern Renaissance type painting or, or 19th century um, Hudson River School type uh, scenes or uh, settings. And then gradually, well, it, it, that's right. And then I think gradually uh, they've moved around depending on what it, what it was I was sort of interested in. I, I think more recently I discovered the the marshy swamps and and things yeah. as, as a great way of. I mean, th there's certain devices that I can em employ with that sort of setting uh, that are nice. There's water that's uh, reflective of light. The nocturnes. That, the nocturnes. The no you... Well, exactly the the nocturnes. A lot of the nocturnes were swampy sort of settings or. Um, sunken marshes or the edges of rivers and things like that. So um, the moon reflecting off, the, the moonlight reflecting off of the water has always been very, very important. Um, uh, and so, but I mean, I, you know, re not too long ago, I did an Arctic scene actually mm -hmm. for a, it was a commission for a, for the National Geographic has this uh, 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 ship that's called the Explorer that they're launching from Norway and they needed a, a piece uh, that reflected Arctic environmental issues. And, and at first I was a little bit uh, not sure what to do, but um, I discovered that uh, the permafrost in Russia, Siberia in the uh, nor Northern uh, hemisphere is sort of melting away and it creates these sort of marshy Arctic mm. um, uh, landscapes that are really strange and surreal and, and beautiful and, and scary at the same time. Scary. Now, was, this, was this installed at their headquarters or actually on the ship? It's on the ship, actually. Um, oh, now, it's technically a, a cruise ship uh, in a, with an environmental sort of um, impetus, and it, but I don't know, I don't know what's happening with it with the pandemic, so, um, so we'll see. So you have a that's, that's a di very different type of landscape. So it just, I guess it just depends on um, uh, what's in my head at the moment or what, you know, what challenge uh, I'm presented with. That's interesting. Well, perhaps we can get you to do the Everglades one day. That would well, be... I think that would be fantastic. I've always wanted to go. I've, I've never been to the Everglades. Have you never been to the Everglades? Oh, no. well, the next trip to South Florida, we'll, we'll know what we're going to, we'll have you add on those airboats. Uh, oh, that, 
I'd love that. A big fan, big fan. Um, uh, so uh, getting back a little bit to the pandemic, uh, has, he, has this been a, a sort of a fertile time of work for you? Uh, a lot of this sort of enforced isolation. Uh, I know you actually opened a show um, in New York in, was it September? The end of September? Or uh, early I was, uh, about, yeah, that's right. About, it was uh, October, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, well, you know, got, we extended it through December, um, which was great. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that was a, so the, the idea of that show started in um, Kansas City with, with the residency. We had a show, uh, the same show in, in Milan. And we had a choice, you know, we could have waited till after the pandemic or we could have, you know, stayed the pushed course. Forward, pushed forward, yeah. And then, you know, and which I decided to do, although we didn't know what that would be like. And I'm glad that we did it because I think at this point it's, uh, it's allowed me to sort of move on to the next thing. And I, you know, the pandemic is an unpredictable, it's been a very unpredictable time. And I don't want to be waiting around for another six months, waiting to, sh you know, show the show and then, then sort of be kept on hold until, until that. Uh, so, so we did the show and it was, uh, I think, very good idea. Uh, it was a wonderful show. And in a way, that's kind of a faith and positivity, isn't it? To just continue on uh, in the face of... Well, I think that's, I think that's what artists do. They, they plow ahead no matter what. Um, always on to the next thing because it's... Uh, it's life, you know, we have to keep going. Um, you know, there, with the pandemic, there are restrictions and uh, we observe those seriously, um, but ultimately you have to keep going and you have to figure out, um, you have to figure that out. It's uh, just what, that's how I look at life. And that's how I look at my art. It's, it's, it doesn't, you don't really put it on hold. It just keeps going, so. Well, there's a, yes, I mean, I, I've noticed um, in our conversations, I mean, you have what I think of as a hallmark I've seen in every successful artist, which is just kind of, it's it really sort of uh, a will and a sort of the will to keep moving forward in uh, with, without being um, distracted by sometimes the things that seem very important, but a refusal to sort of uh, leave that path and to keep moving forward is uh, yeah. is a trademark and personality of of all of the artists I've worked with who've had you know uh, a degree of maturation you should say if not uh, necessarily the biggest commercial success they, that that's the yeah. that's the defining hallmark so. Um, it's interesting. Would you think of yourself as a, do you think of yourself as a solitary person? Because let's talk a little bit about how um, your works are actually, uh, actually hmm. made. Um, I, I think our, our audience might be quite interested in that, given the, the technical precision and detail in them. So, uh, so for, for the piece, for example, in, in the show, a Alienation, uh, it's a, you know, it's one of the dioramas that's viewed through, you uh, uh, it's actually a biconcave lens. It's a, it just reduces things slightly. So as you pull objects further away from the, from the lens, they look a little bit smaller. It's not a, I think we're most used to like convex sort of enlarging lenses or magnifying lenses that make things larger. Mm -hmm. so, th so this together with uh, foreshortening and uh, the use of color and light, you, you know, you can create the illusion of some distance there, a greater distance than actually is. Um, but the the scenes are um, in this particular piece. The uh, it's a meticulous process. It's I work with brushes and tweezers and um, over a period of time and I develop a a scene. Um, generally, I'll start with an idea, uh, but it may change as I as I begin uh, to work on it. Um, everything is artificial, paper, plastic, uh, paint, glue, clay, um, LED lights, and uh, that sort of thing. It's just a matter of taking all these materials and sort of massaging them into, over time, into a scene that that's, right. comes to life at some point. And it very much seems, uh, you know, there's the, the element of stagecraft um, is, uh, it, it, you know, that relationship to the idea of the back of house, the back of the stage, even the, um, 
in the shape of uh, your background sort of remind me of kind of a proscenium arch or, uh, you, you know, the Hollywood Bowl or something, the way that they're curved and the lights are behind it. Now, yeah. this is something that I'm kind of interested in, uh, which is when you, earlier in your career and probably until recently, that you were very highly concerned with the finish, that the, the basically that the back of house not be seen. And that's really changed in uh, your work. It's sort of, is this an opening up, a kind of loosening up that uh, you will now allow the audience, your viewer to go behind the piece and sort of go behind the the magic making as it were. Right, yeah. I. You're right. I think initially what I was most concerned with was your perception of that scene, that sort of very, um, specific point of view that I uh, that I'm looking at. Uh, so I'm I'm looking through those lenses as I as I build that scene. So I'm building that scene according to your point of view. So everything that you're looking at is what I'm fighting uh, or, or uh, struggling to uh, to define. Um, and so that was always the most important. Thing to me. Um, however, uh, you know, over time, you know, people made comments uh, when they saw the works during, during construction or during installation, how interesting it is to see that I can see the process uh, of the construction, or I can see how they're constructed, I can see behind the scenes, um, curtains are sort of pulled back and you see, you know, how the thing actually works. And, and I, I agree with that. I think that's fascinating. I, it's not that I've always wanted to hide that per se. I think initially the presentation was to be uh, surprising, um, unexpected. Unexpected, unexpected. Yeah, I mean, unexpected. I mean, that's kind of the definition of the piece that you have installed at the Museum of Art and Design in New York City. Uh, it's right off Columbus Circle. And to me, that's kind of the ultimate unexpected is that it's on the sidewalk and that you can sort of go by it and then you sort of can enter this enchanted world on a kind of very grubby street corner. <laughs> right. Well, I, th I think you just even the idea, even in, in any space, any even interior or, ex or exterior space, just to walk into a space and then see a, uh, in the distance, a, uh, uh, a, a bit of light in, in the embedded in the wall in the distance. It's like, well, wait, wait, what is that? And as you approach it, you began to realize that, uh, oh, there's a, there's a world or a, a, a space and I can't quite determine the size of it, but I know it's, it's in there behind that glass. I can't quite touch it. I can't feel it, but I, I sense it's three-dimensional quality. It, it has a tactile quality. I feel it in my, in, your, in the brain, you know, so to speak. But I don't really know where where it is, and I don't know how big it is, and I I don't really know what it's made out of, and yet there it is, um, right in front of me, and it's sort of in a way ludicrous to suggest that in embedded in a a white wall in a gallery, there's a you know world of flora and and uh, oh, landscape of but never but never fauna. Right. We've talked about this as well. Like, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated about what the parameters of what you will allow into, very much like you're like a, an artistic weed killer. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> what, well, what, what is permitted to go into the thing? And, and one of the things we're talking about is I've, you know, you, I certainly have had nests and eggs, uh, yeah. the sort of promise of life. And that certainly has, um, um, uh, precedent in a lot of historical landscape painting, but but I know you will not see a bird or a snake. You'll see a, perhaps a shell. A shell would be allowed to go in. Uh, that would be fine, or maybe some tracks. Some uh, uh, or some tracks of, of an animal that had come through. Sometimes some scat. You'll you'll see some droppings uh, of a of a uh, of an animal. So you'll see the the remnants or the um, uh, byproducts of of life. Um, promise of life in the egg, right? That's in the, the egg, uh, or yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, and this really does go back to those uh, pest control manuals that we were talking about before, and that those were s dark and ominous in a way because there was no life in them, and you were left to sort of imagine 
what could be there lurking under the floorboards or digging away under the, under the roots of those plants in your garden. Um, you didn't see them, but you could perceive them. And this. I was going to say, I was also very interested in the idea, I mean, that you won't have a bird or yes. a person because you don't want the stillness to become artificial. Yes. Is that I was right? building I mean, up to that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. I was telling you, that's I think where it began, and then and then you're exactly right. And then as what as time went by, and those those issues, pest control and ominousness, all that sort of drifted away, and it became more imaginative. But I also realized that if you have a rabbit hopping through uh, a field in, in mid air, you're confronted immediately with immediately with the idea of the artificiality of of the scene, you, you're made aware that this is just a, a something that's frozen in time. And you're not really allowed, it prevents you, at least in my mind, from entering that space and feeling in that moment that it really exists in some way um, in real time. Now, if there's a rabbit in midair, then you're not going, it's, you're, you're, that option is eliminated in my mind. Right. Um, now that's not... The ability to enter the scene. To enter the scene. Psychologically. Metaphysically or yes, sort of, sort of transport, but to be, be transported into another space in real time um, is not gonna happen. I think if um, there is a person on a bike and they're you know frozen there, I mean, and then you get into questions of maybe kinetic art, or well, maybe we could, these things could be moving around and then it becomes a whole nother sort of... Uh... Well, the, the question of buildings, because I remember you did a piece, I think that had an that had your apartment. Was it your apartment in it that had the, the, yes. uh, uh, the floor, the, the fire escape? And yep, it, was an empty, right. it was an empty room, but I haven't seen you repeat that very often. I mean, did you edge away from that as, a, as an idea of the sort of the structures coming into these, uh, these landscapes? Uh, the, um, I have not done that many of those. That's, that's correct. And um, that, that series was, um, that in a way that does harken back to those pest controls. They were interior um, images um, that I was recreating. And so from very early on, I did do interior uh, scenes. The, the, they were always mundane. So what would be more mundane or, or common than my own apartment, which is nothing special in Brooklyn, but through the windows, maybe you'll glimpse a sort of imaginative uh, bird's eye view of Pro Prospect Park that you know, was very fanciful, miniaturized, sort of a Northern Renaissance style, sort of like a Jan van Eyck uh, kind of, uh, landscape that didn't exist, was based on, on Brooklyn, but didn't really exist. Um, so it was sort of a, a, a tension that existed between the mundane and the, and the fanciful. Um, that's how those kind of evolved, I think. Um, but I don't, I haven't been doing uh, much of those recently. The Nocturnes, um, okay. recent, the, the show that I did uh, uh, recently, I, I broke, didn't know, there's none of those are interiors. Um, it's interesting. I think about it, it could, ha could have happened. I, I'm, it's interesting because a number of the pieces I've seen from you have either had a dead body, a corpse, a, an anatomical part, uh, <laughs> you know, in them. But I was thinking in a way that the apparition piece that you have in Alien Nations is probably the closest to something that appears like it's going to be animated, but it's frozen in time. Um, uh, in that there's a suggestion of life there uh, that is- I would is, say supernatural life, possibly. Supernatural Super, life. The supernatural, maybe. We'll let that go through, yes, that's the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, so, so I, the, uh, the piece in the show, uh, Rake Leaves Apparition, was, I, th I, I think uh, I'm playing with fear expectations a little bit. I, I, you, there's a couple of implications, I think. One is that um, if you sort of miniaturized yourself and entered that scene or enlarged it in your mind and, and walked into it in normal, <laughs> in normal scale or size, uh, you would see this sort of uh, form 
that's sort of rising up out of the leaves under this bower of uh, uh, roses. And you, you could question, did someone make this? Did someone, some sort of disturbed genius come along and create this, uh, this creature or, or uh, figure? Or, or you could wonder, maybe this thing is actually rising up out of the landscape itself, sort of a manifestation of, of the landscape. Uh, Formation of an ancient druid kind of a thing, or uh, or the super the supernatural in and of itself, or or even the landscape. Um, it's be be becoming manifest in this creature or figure itself, and uh, my I've always been interested in the idea of landscape and and the body and, and human desire, sort of flipping back and forth between. Uh, the body as a sort of a, a place, a, uh, a locus or, 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 or landscape becoming an object or a figure. Um, those, those things have always been interesting to me. I, you know, the thing is smiling in a way, maybe, uh, or shrieking. I don't I know. I would probably be like a rictus grimace, you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, I mean, and that's maybe in a way dark and but you but were sort of the scene is sort of um framed with this sort of delicate uh rose flowers and um beautiful lamps yes, the, ro the rose is a sort of in a way it kind of throws you off guard you see like a bower of, of very pretty roses and it takes a while uh, yeah. you, you need another piece I saw in your studio when we were looking at works for the show and I remember uh, it had quite obviously it looks like either a murdered body, it was a skeleton, it was a large piece. Yeah. And I did not, I, I, you know, it's one of those things uh, where once you, if you haven't seen it, you're just completely, you don't see it in the work. And then when you yeah. do, uh, I had looked at it for quite a, uh, some time. I, it was shocking to sort of see that emerge suddenly um, uh, from the, uh, if I, because I think because it was so unexpected and that yeah. particular piece had a lot of very beautiful poppies in it. And I was sort of thinking about the, the flowers and the color contrast, which were very vibrant in that piece and the, and the lime green background of the piece. And to sort of have that sort of come to the fore was really, uh, it gave me quite a start, I remember. Well, I think that's, I think that's right. I think there's that, that tension that, it, that um, I find pretty exciting to engage with uh, that exists between um, the gruesome or the dark and the, the pretty or the beautiful in a, in a sort of traditional sense, right? Mm. So the, we all work very hard to make the most delicate and, and pretty beautiful flowers with many uh, colors. Um, and yet uh, somehow that has to be undercut. Uh, or leavened in some way, right? There's a... Exactly. And I, I mean, to me, that tension is is fun and engaging. It keeps you there. If it's just beautiful flowers, then okay, it's beautiful flowers. Let's move on. Um, or if it's just a dead body, okay, well, that's kind of dark and weird. And uh, all right, let's keep moving. You know. Um, but if if I can incorporate the two or blend them in such a way or marry them in, in such a way that uh, that heightens the tension, that doesn't let you escape in one way or another. To to to. to to draw an easy conclusion and then and then move on. Then if I just hold you there for a little longer, then um, I'm happy. That reminds me very much of that French concept where I can't remember how to translate now. The beautiful ugly. Um, oh yeah, which is oftentimes I think turned a term towards people. Uh, yes, you know, that's right. Yes, grotesque and yet they're sort of fascinating in their own way, and that that sort of recalled that a little bit uh, of the gorgeous and the. And the ominous. Um, I see one of your many studio assistants back there, uh, <laughs> right behind you. Oh yeah, that was Ben. ben is uh, so a lot of this work has come back from uh, Pierogi uh, oh. over the holidays, and while we sold a lot of things, thank God, which is yeah. amazing and wonderful, uh, that work has to be prepared to be shipped. But the other things that didn't sell, there was a lot of work uh, that has to be reorganized and stored and uh, um, and so my, uh, Ben is uh, has been uh, so incredibly helpful at getting that done so 
That's wonderful. That's it's important. That I always think to have a, a clean studio. So when you walk in, it's like, let's make something. But if there's like mounds of stuff everywhere, it's like, ah. Where do you keep little bits of visual inspiration? Do you get little bits of it? I mean, do you have in some of those neat drawers? Do you have file, you know, clippings of things that you're interested in? Because I'm always interested in for the curatorial work, there's always just mounds of ideas. Some of them go back 10 or 15 years that could be pulled yeah. up time and it's always sort of a struggle to sort of keep that in any sort of cohesive order oh I yes yeah I, I I have sketchbooks and I uh, put things in those I'm always um drawing ideas sketching things down um it's it's great you know when I'm in the subway on the way to the, to the studio it's a good time for that or traveling somewhere um, I mean uh the the figure in the uh Rake Leaves apparition in, in the in the exhibition uh, was a, came out of a series of sketches I did I think on a flight to Florida of, uh, and, and back uh, for another reason but uh, um, sometimes sketches and things are really important the the idea or the shape of things come out of those things um, sometimes it's just the internet images or, or books a uh, uh, lot of internet internet images these days. Yes, well, of course, that's where the, the visual language is now, isn't it? Yeah. And you, you're very, I, I mean, I think in some regard, you are lucky as opposed to uh, some other wonderful artists I've worked with in that your works are highly Instagrammable. I mean, there's a sharpness and delineation um, to them in, in, in an illustrious quality that works very well on the screens that we are all constantly appearing on and sort of yeah. uh, using as our main sort of mode of communicating with the world. So that's a- Well, that's thank a you. That's, that is a challenge. I mean, th these particular pieces in uh, the dioramas, like the show, the piece in the show, um, those are difficult to photograph. Mm. Uh, that take, takes a lot of time because you have, um, uh, there's depth, there's, you're, you're shooting through a lens, a camera lens, and then into another series of, through another series of lenses, a bit of depth that's not natural, but you have, they're backlit, so the light is coming uh, at you uh, through the through the piece, uh, but you have light outside of the piece. So it's, it requires a series of um, photographing it in a, uh, multiple times, and then sort of blending that together in Photoshop. And the idea is just to try to get in that image the crisp, the most crisp representation of. The piece of a two of a three dimensional piece in a, in a two dimensional format, um, which is not easy. Um, it's not. So, it's a, it so I'm glad work. that they work. But you're doing, you're doing a very good job. You're doing a very good job. Thank you, Bart. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I will. I will leave you with a, a, a parting shot. Uh, not a parting shot. That's not the right word. But uh, a question. Far away. Far away. <laughs> Which is like, where do you, where are you going? Where do you go from here? Uh, the vaccine is on the horizon. Uh, I, I should tell you, uh, I should tell our audience, we are talking uh, at about eleven thirty in the morning on inauguration day. So That's right. A, uh, a new. Did you schedule uh, that on purpose. Uh, <laughs> a new era is beginning. Um, and, and where do you see your work going? What, what do you see? What do you see happening for twenty twenty one? That's a great question. Um, um, I right now we're, we're I'm looking at caves right, right now and then this presents uh, it's, it's a very specific it's very sort of tight um, scenario or um, body of work I think uh, the nocturnes was very broad mm. and I think we were all over the place for a while which is wonderful um, but I think caves and and I'll, I'll this needs to be refined exactly but this presents a lot of options uh, from large scale installations um, that are more immersive uh, to smaller pieces in the, in the traditional format of the diorama. Very different kinds of materials though, so mix in colors, mm -hmm. um, as well as prints and drawings and smaller bronzes and uh, ceramics. So, um, and I, I, I'm very excited about it. That's uh, we've already started some things. We're not as far along as I'd like to be, but uh, you um, never are. The next, uh, yeah. Never are really. Yeah. Never done. So that's what we're that's what we're doing next. Wonderful. Well, I wish you a very fruitful uh, 2021 and uh, wonderful sort of artistic productivity.
Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Patrick. Thank you for talking to us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.